what I want to take you through is a journey that ultimately will give you the choice to be Gen Z. You are all Gen Z. Gen Z is a choice that we make. It's a behavioral choice. And it's not about technology. It's about the way that you embrace behaviors that to many of us, to many of us today, seem somewhat absurd. Uh, we're trying to make sense of what Gen Z is, what they do, how they do it. And what we see is the technology, but what we don't see is the behavior. And guess what? Technology is easy to predict. We know Moore's Law. We understand how technology is doubling, how it's increasing exponentially. We get all of that. What we don't get is the behavior. What did you want to be at the age of 12? We wanted to be teachers, doctors, lawyers, who knows what, right? This is what we wanted to be at 12. I wanted to be an engineer. In fact, I wanted to be a civil engineer. I wanted to build big things, not small things like Dad did. I want to build bridges. And he looked at me with that great compassion that only dads have. And he said to me, Tom, if you built a bridge, it would be the most beautiful bridge. I just wouldn't want to be the first person to cross it. <laughs> Dean of the school gets up on a tirade. He wants to talk to us about what it means to be an engineer. He says, from now on, when you look at this chair, you will never again, as an engineer, see four legs. What you will see are four vectors of force. And I thought, shit. <laughs> it took me maybe 20, 25, 30 years to figure out what this guy was saying. Very simply put, we build a lens through which we see the world. And that lens becomes how we add value. I want you to see technology through these new behaviors and to understand how that is going to change your world. We behave as though all the great stuff has already been invented, and why shouldn't we? We are at the apex of civilization, are we not? We built all this stuff. Of course it's great. So tell me, in a word, not in a sentence, not in a phrase, use that great lens that you've built over the course of your career, your lifetime. Tell me in one word, what is it that has gotten us to where we are today? What is it that has allowed us to create the world that we today inhabit. Same word also answers this question, how are we going to overcome all the problems, the challenges that face us? Everything from global warming to feeding the world, all of this will be answered by this one word. What is that word? It's connections. This era of hyperconnectivity that we today inhabit, and I use that term very specifically, hyperconnectivity, because we have no idea how connected we're going to be over the course of the next 10 to 20 years. We'll just begin to see a glimpse of this. On a log scale, every decade since 1960, the number of user computing devices has increased by one order of magnitude. What if we projected that forward? What would that look like? What would the number of user computing devices look like in the future? So we went from, from mainframes to, to PCs to, to, well, departmental computers, of course, remember those things, to laptops, to our mobile devices today, to the cloud. If we project this out by the year 2100, we will have 10 to the 20th total user computing devices, 100 times as many grains of sand as there are on all the world's beaches. We always have a tough time predicting the future. And the reason we do is because we don't get the fact that hyperconnectivity changes behavior. It changes the way that we think about the world. And what it changes most is this ability to find application for technology in behaviors that did not exist in the past. So this is my son. His behavior is all about being online. He had been online for maybe 23 hours straight. I went up and I said, Adam, you know, for God's sake, go outside, get some sunshine. It's a beautiful day. Play with your friends. They must be outside. And Adam said, no, 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 no. My friends aren't outside, Dad. He says to me, Dad, he's really upset at this point. He says, Dad, what did you do when you were my age and there were no computers? I'd go out all day, and your grandmother would ring a bell at the end of the day. I'd come home for dinner, and that would be it. That would be my day. He said, oh, so you'd play in the cul-de-sac with your friends. I said, yeah, I'd play in the cul-de-sac with my friends. What about it? Without missing a beat. He says, you know what, Dad? This, pointing to his computer, this is my cul-de-sac. My response, get the hell outside, get some vitamin D. I don't have a clue. I, I didn't, my parents didn't parent this stuff. 
But to Adam, it's social. He's not isolating himself. This is about being part of a community. It's not about being alone. It's not about doing this in isolation. It's a social activity for him. It's a behavior that he has to adapt to. And here's the key. Because if he wants to be part of that community, he has to adopt the behavior. To Adam, this isn't technology. Technology is what you don't grow up with, right? Technology is what we call it. For Adam, it's just the fiber of the world. It's the way the world works. There's nothing unnatural about this. It's a social exercise that he has to participate in because that's the way that he socializes. This is the way that he connects to the rest of the world. You can avoid the technology all you want, but you can't avoid the behavior. How many of you this morning, before you even got out of bed, before you even got out of bed, check your mobile device? for text, for email, for Facebook. Raise them high, be proud, come on. Look at that, more than half the room. How many of you actually sleep with your mobile device in the same bed? How many? Yeah, there's the 12 single guys in the room right there. Yeah. <laughs> this is me, this is my persona. This is my behavior captured in all of its glory. Those things that I want to admit and those things that I don't, they're all part of this. It's why Google's giving it away. It's why Facebook's giving it away. In the age of training behavior, what is the most important commodity? You and me. But that's going to change. One of the biggest shifts is the demographic shift that's going on right now. When we were writing the Gen Z effect, this blew our mind. For the entirety of civilization, we've been shaped like a pyramid. All the young folks at the bottom, all the old folks at the top, right? It tapers off because we die off as we get older. It's a pyramid shape. For 5,000 years, that's the way the world has looked. That is changing in about 50 years. Population is growing from a few billion to about 10 billion by 2100, where we probably cap off. The carrying capacity of the globe is about 10 billion people. But the pyramid's gone. And by 2100, globally, not just US, not just G7, not just developed countries, globally, in every single geography, there is less than one percentage point separating every five-year age band from birth up through age 65. You will have five generations working side by side in a single organization. It's not about technology here anymore, because we'll all use the same technology, the same platforms, we'll communicate the same way. It'll purely be about how do you manage that diversity of behavior. It changes the organization, and it changes the way you track behavior. When we worked with the folks at Lowe's, Lowe's, the, the, the hardware and home goods store, they told us, and we wrote about this in the book, and we were just astounded, we don't care about your age. Your age doesn't matter. Age is a fallacy. It's a mythology. What we care about is how you behave. And the more touch points we have, to understand how you behave, the better off we are, the more we can personalize your experience, the more likely we are to understand who you are and to make sure that we can offer you things that are relevant to you. And this will happen in a heartbeat. And we don't believe it will because for the last 60 years we've been trying to go to the future and we've been pushed back every time we do. Because you can't go from the present to the future. It doesn't work that way. So we've taken this long, circuitous route, right? And our lens, our lens says to us, Darn it, it takes 60 years to get into the future. It took 60 years to get to tablets and to get to touch-based devices and mobility. And it's going to take another 60 years for us to develop the next generation of technology. No, this very long, arduous journey that you went through, the equivalent of climbing Mount Everest from a technology standpoint, you were customer support for your family, for your friends, right? You were the IT people. No longer, because suddenly, out of nowhere, here comes your 80-year-old mother or grandmother, and she whips out an iPad. And you think to yourself, damn it, this is not fair. It shouldn't be that easy. Slingshotting is what happens when you finally make it into the future. When the devices become so usable, so affordable, so pervasive, and so necessary to be in that cul-de-sac, grandma uses it because for her it's the only way to communicate with her two or three-year-old toddler. It's a necessity. She is Gen Z from that standpoint. It's behavioral. All things should be intelligent. All things should respond to me. All things should exhibit behavior. The Internet of Things is about things exhibiting behavior in connectivity with each other. And we've just begun to sense what that really is like. We're just starting to see that. Some of us never will. The vast majority of us, 
don't plan on retiring. We may work less. We may do more leisure. But we're not going to retire because we don't have to. We can extract value. We can do stuff. We can be intellectually engaged. What did the pundits say the total number of cellular devices deployed in the year 2000 would be? What did they say? 10 million. How many cellular devices are deployed today globally? There are 7 billion people. You want to take a guess? It's over 7 billion. Now, in Russia, it's a two mobile devices per capita ratio. In the U.S., it's about 1.3. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. About 2.7 billion people really globally have cellular devices that are near or on their person. So we still have a large chunk of the population, about 5 billion, that don't. But here's my point. You can't predict the future because you can't factor in the behavior. So watch this next set of ads. Have you ever borrowed a book? And look at how incredibly pessy these ads by AT&T were. The country. e -books, GPS. This is exactly what we Without use today. I mean, it looks like the present day, doesn't it? What year or did these ads hear? The what year do you think it was? From the beach. Our car, please. Carried your medical history in your wallet. Medical records, EMR. We're there today. This is actually even a more prescient view than where we are right now. We probably haven't even gotten to that point yet. WebEx. Faxing from the beach. When's the last time you faxed from the beach? But we knew what tablets would look like. Netflix. What year was it? We thought this was the George Jetson future. It wasn't that long ago, folks. It was 1993. AT&T. AT&T got the future picture perfect. But they didn't bring a single one of these technologies to market, not one. This is what the folks at AT&T have told me, because we were told that it would be erosive to our current marketplace. It would threaten our current technologies. The lens of the past, trying to see the future. It never works that way. The patterns of the past are not the patterns of the future. We're pattern matching engines. It's what we do individually, it's what we do as organizations. We get stuck in the past because we develop patterns that we don't want to let go of. So as uncertainty increases, which we all know it is, you've got shorter and shorter durations of time within which to embrace new patterns. It's a tough, tough thing to do. This is the fundamental challenge. How do I embrace a new pattern in ever-decreasing windows of opportunity? It used to be that I had years or decades. I don't have that anymore. And uncertainty is what happens when I take all the rules away. There's no more rules left. We're going through four derivatives of innovation. We're going from digitization to datafication. You are living right now the transformation, the digital transformation to datafication. We've moved from the device, and here you see the iPod as the example. First derivative, it's about the device. Second derivative, you add some data to it. Third derivative, you put some experience in it. Fourth derivative, it's all about experience. Datafication is what you are doing. Datifying the world is capturing behavior, using that behavior to understand the, the consumer and to create experience. That will be the word for the next two decades. What does the experience look like? And when it comes to experience, there is infinite capacity to innovate. You can innovate as much as you want. There's no limit to this. Because what you're trading on is the behavior of the customer, the behavior of the market, the behavior of the industry, the behavior of the devices. That's the era that we're entering. Digital transformation is about transforming the industry, the way we look at it, the way we work, the way we live, the way that you define yourselves. You are no longer IT. Don't tell me you want to sit at the table because guess what? You built the damn table. There is no business without you. The business is the technology. We call it technology because we didn't grow up with it. It is the business. The, the, the two are one and the same. And these kids get it. And they will hack the heck out of every system to make it work the way that they want. When we wrote the book, we talked about two folks, Shuman Mulamuri, who built in, with a 3D printer an, a, an iPhone case that replaces over $200,000 worth of in-hospital equipment. Just the case alone allows you to hear the, the uh, low-frequency sounds the heart makes when certain conditions are, are apparent. He did this when he was 13 years old. What the hell were you doing at 13? This next fellow, Easton LaChapelle, Easton built prosthetic devices that use something along the lines of what you see on my, on my wrist right now that track your muscle movements, which is how I'm controlling some of this presentation. And by doing that, he was able to build a prosthetic for $800 that would otherwise cost over $80,000. Here's the cool thing. Easton gave it away. It's open source. When we talked to Easton, I said, why would you give it away? Why wouldn't I? How can I not? I have to give it away. 
You'll be working with these kids because you'll continue working. Our life expectancy is increasing. Our work life expectancy is increasing. Guess what? In 2100, the two will intersect. You will be working after you're dead. <laughs> Remember the clip from the Titanic? They see the iceberg. Iceberg straight ahead. They called him from the crow's nest. Here's what's cool. They did everything right. They did everything right. But the Titanic behaved differently. Their behavior hadn't caught up to the technology. The Titanic had three screws, not two or one. And because it had three screws, it could pivot. The last thing in the world you wanted to do is what the chief engineer is going to do in just about a second here. Reverse the engine. No. Oscillate the screws. The thing could pivot on a dime. So despite the fact that the rivets were made out of poor quality slag, despite the fact that there weren't enough lifeboats, despite the fact that the meteorological conditions at the time didn't allow us to see the iceberg quickly enough, despite all of that, they still could have avoided the crisis. Forget it. Don't worry about any of that. All I want you to remember is one thing. I want you to look into the eyes of the first officer. Why isn't she turning? I'll tell you for why she's not turning, because your behavior hasn't caught up with this technology. Forget that, too. Remember this, see that look, fear, doubt, uncertainty. If you ever see that look in the eyes of leadership, get the hell off the boat. <laughs> Who said this? Everything that can be invented has been invented. Charles Dill, commissioner of the US Patent and Trademark Office. You want to guess when? 1899. We don't believe it, but we behave it. Change what you believe by changing how you behave. Welcome to Gen Z. Thank you.